Robots. Machines built by mankind to replicate mankind. Aliens. Extraterrestrial beings that wish to be taken to our leader. Imagine if they were all more on the feminine side. Oh, you mean like Starfire? The Tamaranian princess who fights on behalf of the Teen Titans? What about Android 18, former enemy of the Z Fighters? You guys know what time it is. Time for our first ever Fatal Fiction cat fight. Wait a minute. Cat fight? I thought that Black Cat vs. Catwoman was next season. I'm Proto Dude. I'm Red Wolf. I'm Gamehawk. And it's our job to evaluate both the strengths and weaknesses of these combatants. Back when Son Goku was just a boy, he went on a mission to collect all seven Dragon Balls. Little did he know, the Red Ribbon Army just so happened to be after the exact same go. Thanks to its lead scientist, Dr. Jero, the Red Ribbon Army had flourished in the fields of robotics. Luckily, Goku was no ordinary boy. He managed to defeat all of Dr. Jero's creations, along with the rest of the Red Ribbon. However, being the brilliant child that he is, Goku let one man escape the brain of the Red Ribbon, Dr. Jiro. Inspired by Goku's incredible might, Jiro no longer had any desire to build an army. I mean, come on, if one kid in an orange jumpsuit with a monkey tail can plow through your entire army with ease, what's the point of even having an army? At least it's not as embarrassing as having your entire army beaten by a kid in an orange jumpsuit with whiskers and fox inside of him in a bandana that makes him look really stupid. Oh, God. Anyways, Dr. Jiro focused not on rebuilding his army, but on creating only a few soldiers, each of them with enough power to defeat any army on Earth, even the Z Fighters. However, in order to ensure that his creations would be powerful enough to match Goku, he would have to study the Saiyans every move. After creating a remote tracking device disguised as a ladybug, Dr. Jero made it follow Goku everywhere, recording all of his fights. All of his fights, until he left to visit Namek and save the universe from Mewtwo's androgynous brother, that is. Regardless, the data that he analyzed was more than enough to create the perfect murder machines, including a pair of artificial humans he called Android Number 17 and Android Number 18. A human named Lazuli, our favorite blondie, used to be a notorious mischief maker. While he was out fishing for guinea pigs, Dr. Jiro would meet Lazuli and her twin brother Lapis. Lapis Lazuli? We get it, Red Wolf. We get it. Back to the point. After kidnapping the twins, he used his magic science to transform them into cyborgs. Hey, is magic science an oxymoron? Then why are they called androids? Because Funimation hired a random person off the streets to translate the script for them, and the mistranslation just stuck. Being an artificial human, Android 18 has no need to eat. Furthermore, her cells deteriorate at a snail's pace, allowing her to age far slower than any human. And yet she still needs to drink. To which I ask, why? Something tells me that we should really stop trying to apply logic to anime. The two concepts mix about as well as peanut butter and tuna salad. Well, friggin said. Anyways, after Android 18 was awakened, it became clear that she was one of the strongest foes yet. As an artificial human, Android 18's stamina is nearly unlimited. As demonstrated in the battle between 17 and Piccolo, an android's key reserve is nearly impossible to exhaust in a single duo. In other words, she has a lot of staying power. You can't keep this up. You'll tire out. Thanks to her enormous amount of ki, Android 18 possesses superhuman strength, insane combat speed, and enough durability to endure whatever attacks come her way. Furthermore, the form of ki she holds is unique, and cannot be detected even by other ki users. If you think that spells trouble for her enemies, just wait until you see her techniques. Like the Android Barrier, where energy launches out of her body to create an omnidirectional shield that not only defends against projectiles, but damages anything eclipsed by it. Let's not forget the Destructo Disc, a projection of ki shaped like a blade that can slice through mountains, or freeze his tail. She could even throw it in pairs of two! This technique was most likely taught to her by her husband, Krillin. Wait a minute, Krillin married a hot chick? That's impossible! Almost as impossible as a power level above 9000. Oh wait, that happened two sagas ago. Are we really doing an over 9000 joke in 2015? There's no way that could be right! It can't! 
Of course, Android 18 is also familiar with the basics of Key, able to use everything from energy waves to finger beams to flight. And of course, there's her ultimate technique, the energy mine. By launching five yellow spheres around her opponent, she can bounce them around like a pinball until they explode. For a mere robo chick, Android 18 has accomplished some unbelievable feats within the Dragon Ball universe. I bet you can't beat a Super Saiyan. You were saying? Well, it looks like Vegeta sure got disarmed. He's not the only Super Saiyan to get disarmed by her. She also defeated future Trunks with ease, effortlessly shattering his sword in the process. The same sword that he used to slice through Frieza like a knife through hot butter. You know, the dude who's durable enough to survive a planet buster while half his body is missing? The dude who can get up from a spirit bomb? The dude whose ultimate desire is to caress those lovely bunch of balls for eternity. Having these balls makes me feel something that resembles joy, I think. I want to caress them. She's managed to kill both Tien and Piccolo with one clean hit, overpowered future Gohan, curb stomp Trunks, and effortlessly terminated Krillin. Even Krillin was destroyed by the ruthless duo. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Did he just say even Krillin was destroyed? Seriously? That would be like if somebody beat the Avengers and then went, man, it was sure impressive how I kicked Hawkeye's ass. It should be noted that the android responsible for wiping out the Sea Fighters was not the Android 18 of the main Dragon Ball world, but rather the Android 18 that exists in a parallel timeline. A timeline that contained weaker heroes and weaker androids. Wait, you're telling me that the Android 18 in the present is even stronger than her future counterpart? How is that even possible? Because... Uh, reasons? The Android 18 of the present timeline is not only stronger, but also less of a murderous psychopath. She even became a heroine, and had a daughter with Krillin. A daughter that Krillin named after his ex-girlfriend. I wish I was joking. Wait, there's one thing I still don't understand. The fact that she settled with Baldi over here? No. What I don't get is how the hell an android or cyborg or artificial human or whatever the hell she is managed to get pregnant. She doesn't eat, runs on an internal battery, had a bomb inside her that could kill her, yet somehow she can give birth to a healthy baby girl? Logic. Show me logic. This is the same show that thinks aliens look exactly like humans apart from tails, five-year-olds can kill dinosaurs, and that if you scream like you're constipated for five minutes straight, you achieve the ultimate power. I think they threw logic out the window a long time ago. That aside, her most impressive feat of all is, without a doubt, defeating Hercule Satan. And that dude is strong enough to single-handedly beat up Cell. Actually, that was just, uh... Dude, Hercule was strong enough to beat Cell. Well, can't argue with that, I suppose. That alone makes her the strongest girl in Dragon Ball. Strongest girl in Dragon Ball? How's that even an accomplishment? That's like being the friendliest of friends and friends. Yeah, while Android 18 was easily one of the strongest characters at the time of her debut, she has long since been surpassed by the likes of Majin Buu, Bills, the Z Fighters, and Cell, who absorbed her in the most suggestive looking scene known to Dragon Ball. After the Cell Saga, Lazuli over here neglected to train resulting in her failing to keep up with her peers. But even if she did train, her so-called slope is rather limited, and her power level cannot grow as quickly as a Saiyan's can. Another problem Android 18 faces is that she has never once fought an opponent on her level. In every battle she has participated in, she was either curb stomped or did the curb stomping herself. And since it's usually the latter, her mindset in battle is one of overconfidence. Also keep in mind that because she usually fights with her brother, she's not very used to solo combat, and her best attacks all revolve around teamwork with him. And finally, a weakness so great it needs to be brought up again. She's married to Krillin. That noseless midget is one lucky bastard, that's for sure. I have to whip you into shape every now and then, honey. Try not to kill me, baby! A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there lived a race of aliens called the Tamaranians on a planet called Tamaran. 
it's like calling people from Florida Florians. The Tamaranians were an emotional race who used feelings as the force that drove their livelihoods. They were led by King Myander and Queen Luander with three different heirs to the throne. The backstabbing princess named Commander, also known as Blackfire. The young Prince Randir also known as Wildfire. And the cheerful Princess Coriander, also known as Starfire. Wait a minute, isn't Coriander a cooking herb or something? Huh. But one day, the unthinkable happened. Tamaran was invaded by Gordanians. The Tamaranians fought back, but they were outnumbered, and soon the once lush and beautiful tropical planet became war-torn and ravaged. As it turns out, Blackfire betrayed her home planet out of jealousy for her younger siblings, resulting in their parents dying, Tamaran being torn apart, Wildfire being sent to another galaxy never to be seen again, and Starfire being sold as slave. Wally, what a douche. But as it turns out, slavery was a blessing in disguise for Starfire. As she was being transported by her captors, she used her innate alien strength to escape the prison ship, and landed on the nearest planet, that being Earth. After meeting Robin and going through a series of random events, the Teen Titans were formed. They would go on to become the strongest team of sidekicks the Earth had ever seen, and the brawn of the team was not Cyborg, but rather it was the Tamaranian Princess herself. Of course, what would an alien superhero in be without superpowers and heroin? Considering that Tamaranians are a race of natural-born warriors, they tend to be skilled in martial arts, and Starfire is no exception. That's perfect, Robin. Hold <gasps> me just like that and... <laughs> Am I interrupting? Not at all. Blackfire was just showing me some alien martial arts. I wish I could learn some Tamaranian martial arts. She was even taught how to use a bow and arrow. On that note, the Tamaranians are an emotional race. Feelings are the force that drive their very livelihoods. Because of this, Starfire is inherently the most sensitive member of the Titans. Not those abominations. Indeed. In fact, her natural flight is fueled by her unbridled joy. The hell? I remember how I noticed Proto Dude was excited when he first saw me, but I didn't see him flying. Well, it has more to do with her Tamaranian physiology than anything else. It even allows her to fly in the vacuum of space without oxygen for extended periods of time. With her boundless confidence, Starfire becomes practically a flying brick, with incredible physical strength and durability. Flying brick on fire. That was also a star. Incredible physical strength and durability. And thanks to a righteous fury, Starfire can project powerful energy blasts ranging from star bolts to energy beams to eye lasers. Geez, I wonder how she can do those without burning her eyes off. Well, it is explained that Tamaranians can resist intense amounts of heat and radiation after all. Most bizarrely, whenever she kisses somebody, she learns whatever language they speak, which led to her kissing Robin to learn English, and then a Japanese boy right in front of Robin. <laughs> Somebody tell her to kiss me. I need to learn Japanese so I can watch anime without subtitles. Um, that doesn't work the other way around, Red Wolf. No! My otaku dreams! Over the years, Starfire has performed an encyclopedia's worth of impressive feats, having been shown to push back meteors that threatened the Earth and tear through a barrier that was powered by the core of an entire planet. And let's not forget the scene where she survived the bomb that destroyed a planet several times over. Indeed. Starfire's durability is so great, she could survive being at the epicenter of a blast that consumed a planet many times over. You may proceed safely. Way to go, Star. Good job. To put this into perspective, that would mean Starfire can withstand a blast capable of destroying the Earth a thousand times over, releasing 60 Yodatons worth of TNT equivalent, aka 60 septillion tons of TNT. That's a number with 25 zeros at the end. For comparison, it would take about 45 Yodatons of TNT to destroy planet Saturn. Holy shit! I bet that attack must have injured her for at least a week. Nope. 
right after being hit by the explosion, the only consequence was her hair was messed up. You mean to tell me that she got hit with an explosion big enough to destroy Saturn and it only ruined her hairstyle? Jesus, and people complain that Superman is overpowered. Moving on, she's no slouch in the speed department either. Her speed is so great, she can exceed the speed of light. That's over 300 million meters per second. This allows her to fly across solar systems in short time periods and dodge beams of light from, you guessed it, Dr. Light himself, and not the Mega Man character. The main problem with some of Starfire's speed feats is that most of the celestial objects in the Teen Titans universe are fictional, meaning that it's nearly impossible to get an accurate number for the planet's dimensions, and by proxy, Starfire's speed. Thankfully, there's one scene we can draw from to determine Starfire's maximum speed. And that is when she flew past the moon in a fraction of a second. On average, the moon is about 384,000 kilometers away from the Earth. By playing the scene in slow motion, we can determine that she flew past it in about one-tenth of a second, meaning that she can fly over 1.5 million kilometers in a single second, making her around at least four times the speed of light. However, there is also Teen Titans Go to consider in which she is powerful enough what to. Was that? Um. Teen Titans. Teen Titans. That the wind? Was that... Dang, there's a, there's a storm outside. Whoa! Uh, that's, that's one hell of a storm. But in Teen Titans Go, she's really strong. We can't. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, fine. We don't talk about Teen wait, Titans Go. Wait, wait. Do you hear that? Shh. You hear that? Shh. Aside from Raven, Starfire is easily the strongest member of the Teen Titans. She's even bested her sister Blackfire on numerous occasions, and perhaps her most notable accomplishment was when she not only stood up to the planet-busting, reality-warping Trigon, but also defeated his heralds. That said, she's not exactly invulnerable. For example, when she gets a code, it's really painful for her considering that she constantly sneezes out explosive star bolts. <laughs> At least she doesn't sneeze away solar systems. That would just be ridiculous. Being a Tamaranian, she has also been subject to xenophobia for most of her life, especially from other alien races. Yes. You know what it feels like to be judged simply because of how you look? Of course I do. I'm part robot. <laughs> I have no idea why such a specific weakness was written, but thanks, DC Comics. Uh, doesn't DC stand for Detective Comics anyways? Wouldn't that be Detective Comics Comics? Well, holy redundant department of redundancy, Batman. It's Proto, man. I mean, Proto Dude. I mean, yeah, Proto Dude. Nobody cares! <sighs> Let's just get the elephant out of the room. Starfire is... not the brightest. After all, she's young and naive. New to Earth's customs, if you will. Despite this, she isn't really stupid per se. A woman who celebrates drapery abuse and drinks mustard like water sounds really stupid to me. Now, she may not be a genius, but she's always been a wise, perceptive individual. In fact, she was the first one to figure out that Robin wasn't behind the probes in the episode Apprentice, and she figured out that he was Red X before anybody else did. I, uh... Am the Doctor Amazing Mumgon, the Terrible, and this is my henchman, uh, Henchy. You were saying? It, you, you know what? Never mind. But hey, at least she's a better character than her slutty comic book counterpart. Well, besides that, she loses a lot of her power under circumstances where she is depressed. But that's no reason to underestimate her. You know why? Because she's a member of the Teen Titans. I'm stronger than I look. Heh, <laughs> <laughs> looks like this is going down on Starfire's home turf. This city sure was fun. It's a shame that it must come to an end. you Clord Bane Valbernick! Now that I have finally found you, no further
other cities shall be victims of your destruction! Foolish girl. If you're this eager to meet your doom, I'll happily oblige. Fight! <laughs> more of a challenge. I will transform you into metal scraps! Was that you were saying about turning me into scrap metal? <laughs> Evil fatality. Holy crap, a Dragon Ball character just beat a DC character? Quick, everybody call the presses! Sarcasm aside here, this battle was an extremely close call, but in the end, Android 18's destructive capability and durability were too much for poor Starfire to handle. After all, while Starfire can survive the planet-busting mine that released 60 Yoda tons worth of explosives, Android 18 managed to curb stomp Super Saiyan Vegeta. For reference, Super Saiyan Vegeta is even stronger than Frieza's final form, and even Frieza's first form was powerful enough to destroy Planet Vegeta. As Planet Vegeta had 10 times the gravity of Planet Earth, that should put its gravitational binding energy in the ballpark of 700 Yoda tons of TNT equivalent, which Frieza must have overpowered in order to destroy it. But Proto, what about speed? Surely Android 18 isn't fast enough to keep up with Starfire now, is she? Well, you see, 18 doesn't have many speed feats of her own, but as we all know, she was able to keep up with the likes of Vegeta and Trunks. As early as the Saiyan Saga, Piccolo's beams were fast enough to reach the moon in the ballpark of around 5 seconds. That is about 200,000 times the speed of sound, or about one-fourth the speed of light. While Starfire may be faster, Android 18 can certainly hold her own, and with the massive strength advantage, this was by all means her battle to win. In strength versus speed debates, always side with the top 
part of the Triforce. Especially when the stronger opponent can fight for a virtually unlimited amount of time without the slightest hint of exhaustion. Let's not forget that while Starfire is a powerful flying alien with energy projection, Android 18 has plenty of experience not only with fighting, but also with utterly demolishing them with ease. I guess Android 18 is the star of this pyrotechnic show. The winner is Android 18, the loser. This is everybody who likes Teen Titans. Hey, at least our show is better than Teen Titans Go, right? Yeah, I swear there's a really annoying mosquito buzzing around. Shut the fuck up. Foolishness, Dante. Foolishness. I'm reluctant to make the kill. <laughs>